Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Depends on where you are in the world. Here's just some other things. Yes, I'm a, a data platform MVP. I used to be known a, an awful lot for doing integration services, so I helped write a book many years ago on integration services. Okay, so what we're going to cover then? So we're going to have a look at the, what is this thing called the Lambda architecture. So I've been delivering this deck, this subject, for a little while now. It seems to be getting an awful lot of traction. I've also used this methodology a lot in my day job. We're going to look at ingestion, which is how do you get data into Azure and how do you keep it there. So it's this, that part of it is very important for me because it helps to stabilize everything afterwards. We're going to have a look at the hot path. Now, the hot path is something which people initially, when you tell them about the hot path, i.e. the real-time streaming stuff, people's eyes usually flip and nobody ever needs it. So then you go through it and people think, well, I could actually do something with that. So we'll go through some of that. And Microsoft are trying to take away the, the idea that you need to have a PhD to be able to do it. Then we'll have a look at a quick look at the cold path. And the cold path is more the traditional path. So it's your integration services, your ADF, your picking up and moving into a data warehouse. And we'll have a look at, little look at serving. Now, we've only got an hour. So I'm going to touch on a whole load of topics. And um, I want to make time just to show you um, some stuff from the hot path at the end. So let's get going. OK, so the old and new of data processing, right? So this is the old way. This is the, this is the way that everybody understands currently. We have our OLTP systems, we have our ERP, we have our line of business. And on a schedule, be that usually daily, maybe hourly, uh, perhaps weekly, we'll pick it up. And our favorite ETL tool of choice is, is quite often integration services. We'll pick it up, munch it around, we'll do some conforming, we'll do some transformations. And then we'll put it into our enterprise data warehouse, and that could be that could be anything. For example, it could be SQL Server, Teradata, or even Microsoft Access if you're going to go out on a limb. But that doesn't really work in the modern world. Well, it does work in the modern world, but nowadays there's just so much more, right? There's so much more, uh, so many more types of data that people want to use. No longer are we limited to rows and columns. People have these. Um, eye watches, these Microsoft bands, these wear health wearables, that are sending data, or the ability to send data all the time, keep coming, keep coming. JSON is becoming a very prevalent format. And traditional tools generally don't deal with that very well. Right? So if you've used XML inside integration services, it's not the world's greatest of experience. So we'll ingest that data in our modern world, and we'll do something with it, right? So we'll, we, there's a couple of examples of storage here, which is HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. And you've got blob storage, and there's other types of uh, storage available. And then what you'll do is you'll transform it, and, and you'll load it into your destination, right? So you'll have this idea of a big compute. And you notice there that we've got streaming data. So that seems to be all the time now. People People are wanting to talk about. Okay, I've got, I've got this um, web app. I've got this telemetry system that is constantly sending out data. No idea what to do with it. I haven't previously done anything with it because I don't understand how to get it. And hopefully, by the end of this um, this uh, presentation, you'll be able to say, okay, I can maybe do something with that. Okay, here's the basics of the Lambda architecture. So we'll start left to right. And we've got this buffered ingestion. So this is where all of your data is going to come in. So the big fat arrow on the left is your devices, your sensors, your thing that's chucking data up into Azure. Very, very, very first thing that we need to do is we need to ingest it. We need to get it into some kind of resilient container. Yeah, so get it into a resilient container. There's a number of those that Microsoft have, and we'll cover that in, in a couple of slides time. But the main thing is, get it into a container so we can consume it. Right, so it's in the container. And now what we need to do is we need to hook something on. We need to put a listener over the top, and we need to take 
those events and do something with it. And this is the hot path, remember. So this is going to be the hot path. So we could do event decoration and some processing logic. So maybe if you're where if you've got one of these wearables and it's got a panic button on it, this is where you would react to that panic button being pressed. This is where you would react if you were an online betting company. This is where you would react perhaps to um, what you detected as being suspicious behavior. So you could stop the market, so you could do something like that. So this is where you would do your initial processing logic. And you're going to put it into a hot store. Hot store could be something like HBase, which is a column database in Hadoop, Hadoop database. Or it could be something like an event hub, right? so another queue where you can go read from. So what we've done is we've we've looked at the data that's on uh, the queue at the start, and we've consumed it, and we've reacted to things that we need to react to in real time. But what we want to do as well is we also want to take that data and we want to put it into colder storage, something that we can go and use as an archive data source later. So you can imagine that we would want to do that for trend analysis, historical analysis. Where have we where have we been? Where are we now? And potentially where are we going? Like right? that's not the kind of thing that you want to be doing in a real time architecture. That's the kind of thing that you want to be doing end of the day, end of the week. And likewise, detecting credit card fraud is something you want to be doing in the real time layer and not at the end of the week because by the end of the week your bank account's emptied, everybody that's stolen your money is in the Bahamas on a boat somewhere fishing. Right, which doesn't really help. And once you get it into that cooler store, what you're going to do is you're going to pick it up and move it. And you're going to curate, curate, curate that data. And remember, this looks like our traditional way of doing things. So we'll have that data at rest, and we'll pick it up, do something with it, and then we'll push it through to an analytical store. Once in the analytical store, we can put some kind of consumption or serving layer over the top. Now notice how I don't only mention dashboards here because it could be it could be a whole load of things that you, you put on the top. It could be that you just um, manipulate it using um, R or something like that. Right. So it may be that you want to give it to um, a data scientist and say, look, there's a whole load of curated data. Go see what we can find out. So what I've done here is I've just broken those individual sections out into uh, those individual items out into four sections. So we've got the ingestion, we've got the processing, staging, and consumption. When I've delivered this um, deck before, one of the things that people said were missing, was missing was what are the things that fit over there? So in Azure, what fits each of these um, items? So what I what I've done now is I've Try to fit over the top exactly what you would use to build this system. So if, again, if you start from ingestion, two things. You're either going to use event hubs or you're going to use IoT hubs. Yeah. So event hubs are what uh, were previously the only thing available. But now Microsoft have, have um, introduced something called IoT hubs, which allows an awful lot, which allows an awful lot more scenarios for your IoT um, topology. And we're going to cover more IoT Hub. And we're going to talk about what it is, the bi-directional communication, the ability to talk and acknowledge conversations with the device. So you get a whole load more um, interaction. Then for the real-time stuff, stream analytics. So stream analytics allows you to compose a query over the top of a moving stream. And they, you can do it in a language which is very, very similar to SQL. So we all feel warm and fuzzy. We don't have to learn a new language and it, um, it becomes easier for us to do it. And I'll show you later on, I'll show you exactly how to build that. There's only three moving parts. You'll see that there's the machine learning icon there as well. Relatively recently, Microsoft introduced the ability for you in your real-time data processing to be able to call out to machine learning endpoint past data and get an answer back and use that in your um, in your decision-making that you're doing of your real-time data. 
Now, as we come down, uh, so sorry, if we move over to the hot star, hot star here, I've chosen to illustrate the elephant, which is Hadoop, which means Hadoop database, which is the column database that I was talking about earlier. But there's others available. For the curl store, I've chosen to use blob store. Yeah, so blob store is a nice, um, scalable, relatively cheap way of storing a whole lot of data. Right. And you can pick that up using Azure Data Factory. So that's the curation will pick it up. So Azure Data Factory picks up the data in blob storage and then it moves it through to the analytical store. Two analytical stores that we've decided on here. We've got Azure Data Lake Store, which is WebHDFS, which is Microsoft's implementation of HDFS. And we've got Azure SQL Data Warehouse, right, which is another, um, which is a massively parallel processing database. And we'll cover bits and pieces of that later. So all of these, except for machine learning, we're going to have a little look at all of these. And finally, over on the right-hand side, I've chosen to show the icon for Power BI. One of the things that we can do now in streaming analytics is that we can push data directly into Power BI. So if you want that realish time graph of what's happening, you can push data into Power BI and have a graph there that will, that will tick. Say every second it will tick and you will see the state of things going on. Just a quick call out to the Cortana Intelligence Gallery. You can provision pre-built solutions from the gallery, and you'll see that they pretty much follow exactly what I've just shown you, that whole hot path called path serving layer. So if you, if you want to have a look at a pre-built solution, head on over to the Intelligence Gallery and have a look over there. OK, so let's, let's start looking at each of these four stages, or these four parts. So the first one we're going to look at is we're going to look at ingestion. So with ingestion, like I was saying, uh, ingestion is where you will push data into a broker ready for further processing. There's um, LinkedIn, for example, you use Kafka as their, their broker, and they store terabytes on their Kafka queue. With, with um, IoT Hub and Event Hub, you can store a lot of data and replay it, replay it, replay it, and you can go back, you can wind it back. It's like a VHS uh, video system. You can rewind, play forward, rewind, play forward, and it's insanely useful, right? And then you can push it forward for further processing. Okay, what have we got? We got five things. IoT Hub, which we're going to do uh, more of, bidirectional communication. That means not only does your device get to talk to Azure, the IoT Hub, but the IoT Hub can also send messages back to your device. That is a scenario that isn't available with the Event Hub. So maybe you need, you look at data coming off of your device and you say, you know what, we need to do something with that device. I need to send a message to that device to do something, because if we don't, something's going to go bang, right? So IoT Hub allows you to send a message back to the device and the device can take action. You've got to code it, but it allows it to take action. Event Hub is mass ingestion. Throw data up, big data, big amounts of data, throw it up, but it only goes one way. It goes from devices, sensors, into Event Hub and out the other end. It doesn't come back. Event Hub can't talk back to the device. Service bus. Service bus is still a very, very competent uh, queuing ingestion mechanism. And certainly, if you've got complex filters, processing rules that you need to do with your data, it's still a very, very good uh, way of doing it. Kafka, if you're coming from uh, the Hadoop world or the open source world, Kafka is probably something that you'll use. Right? And you can now use that in Azure. And good old RabbitMQ. Uh, see this a lot. RabbitMQ, very good way of queuing. So there's, there's, there's a few ways of doing this, um, but IoT Hub's the one with really which we're going to expand on now. OK, Alan, IoT Hub. Alan, sorry to yes. interrupt. We've just had um, uh, Kate has asked if you could go back one slide. So 
I presume it's not not the last one you've just done, but the one before. Shout. That one. No, I think it's the one before that. That one. She's not told me which one, but she said back one slide. So this this was the one back one slide. Okay. So she's not actually said why she wants you to go back, but I presume it's just to go over it again, if you could. Okay. Thanks. So, so no problems, no problems, because yeah. So if so, that's, so thanks for that, Mark, because I can't. I'm trying to leave a pause for when um, I click on the button, and then hopefully you'll be able to see it. But if you can't see it, just shout at Mark, and he can shout at me. Oh, she's just come back, and she said showing all the tools for each section. Oh, which what? Which one? This one. She says thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so remember if you read from left, go up, come down, and over to the right. So you've got Event Hubs, IoT Hubs as your ingestion, Streaming Analytics and Machine Learning as your Event Decoration, Event Processing. I've gone for HBase as the hot store. Blob Storage as the um, cold store. We could have used um, ADLS, which is um, Data Lake Store. I've chosen blob storage. Picking up from blob storage is a zero data factory, and then we can move through into something that's got the grunt, something that's um, got the ability to scale out and do massive processing, which happens in this case to be Azure Data Lake Analytics and Data Warehouse. Okay, so hopefully that's covered that off. Now what I'm going to do now is just skip back to where we were. Okay, IoT Hub. IoT Hub is designed for you to connect millions of devices to a partition back end. Right? So it's designed to handle the millions of devices. So I don't think I've worked anywhere or had a system where there's millions of devices, but I certainly have um, done systems that have hundreds of thousands of devices. You can talk backwards and forwards, so remember, what I said about this, the IoT Hub is a brilliant way for you. It's enabling the scenario where you need to talk back to the device. Right? So you need to send something back. Cloud scale, so it scales nicely. You've got, you've got the concept of units and for different SKUs. There's a free SKU right, for IoT Hub. It allows you 8,000 messages per day, per, but you can only add one unit. So it allows you 8,000 messages per day, but it's free, right? So if you don't knock the living daylights out of it, you will be able to have 8,000 messages per day. You then move up to the next SKU, which is 400,000 messages um, per day per unit, and the other SKU, which is an S2, is crazy nuts. Right? So you're allowed something like 1.6 million messages per unit per day. So it depends on what you, um, how much throughput you've got, you need, you just get the right SKU. But this is one of those services, like I said, where you get a free SKU. So there's no excuse for not just having a little play, right? Just having a little, okay, if I enable this device, what happens? You get delivery receipts, right? So when a device connects, it says, okay, I'm here. Then what happens is if the IoT hub needs to send a message back, it says, when you get this, can you tell me if you've got it? Because internally I'm holding a queue, and if you don't get it and don't tell me about it, I'll have to keep it on this queue because I need to retain it for a day, two days, three days, whatever you set. But if you tell them the thing, okay, I've got it, you can you can get rid of it, then it'll be able to clear it from the internal queue. Right. So there's that whole acknowledgement, and we'll see an example of that when I show the demo. This is another biggie, right? With um, the difference between the IoT Hub on the event hub. IoT hub allows per device authentication. The very first thing that you're going to do with IoT hub is you're going to go up to the registry manager and say, hi, my name's Alan, please can I have a key? And it's going to say, yep, there you go, that's your key, only your key. Next device, Mark goes up and says, can I have a key? And it says, yep, there you go, that's your key, nobody else's key. Event hub, you go with policies. Policies are event hub wide, means the policy gets compromised, you've got a whole load of devices which need to be Rekeyed. Whereas this, you say, you know what, that device, Alan's been compromised, we'll stop him connecting. Right? So it allows you a much finer level of granularity in authentication. Okay, so you've got uh, the ability to do 
cloud to device, device to cloud. Multi-protocol, so you can do AMQP and HTTP. HTTP is a connect-disconnect. So you'll connect, send your messages, disconnect, connect, send your messages, get anything back from the hub that you need to. You'll do the whole disconnect, connect, disconnect, connect. AMQP is sticky, so you'll generally connect and stick. Right? And you'll have this lovely conversation with the IoT hub. And finally, there's pretty much an SDK for everything you can think of. Right? So real-time operating systems, proper ones, Linux, Windows, all over. So you can connect using pretty much any device you want. Okay, stream analytics. So now we'll move on to the processing part. So now we've got our data in buffered ingestion. So we're busy throwing up as much device uh, data as possible, throwing in as much device as we were ill, throwing in as much device data as possible. We now need to put something over the top that will listen. This is where we can have multiple instances of a listener or a processor or a worker or whatever you want to call it, listening to the data and reading it off. So remember, these reads are not destructive reads either. These reads, you can read the message, go backwards, read it, backwards, read it. I can read the messages that Mark's just read. He can read the messages that I've just read. If we decide tomorrow, you know what, I'm going to change the way that I read it. When I read the data, I've got some rules that I apply to the data. What happens if I change that? Okay, let's go back to yesterday's data, play it against new rules, do things change? Right, so you can go back, 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 and you can just keep going forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Right, I've seen that used as a real-time engine on a weekend, so, they, so people process their data in close to real-time on the weekend, but then in the office on the Monday, They'll go back and they'll say, you know what, when we process that data, I want to change the way we do that. So I'll just wind it back and replay it with what was live data. So this is about that processing. How do we do that? So it's a difference between bounded and unbounded processing. So remember that first diagram that I showed you with the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things? That's bounded and unbounded processing. So bounded processing is your traditional querying, right? You're querying a fixed state. Very rarely does your data warehouse constantly change underneath you. I reckon you probably load your data warehouse at most every hour. Most people would load it every, every day, right? So there there been generally be an end of day load into the data warehouse. So you're querying a fixed state. Yeah? So you've essentially frozen the data whilst you query it. That means that it should finish in roughly the same amount of time every time. But also, the data, if you issue the same query, you should get the exact same data back. So bounded, right? You've, you've got a set of data that you're working from, and it's not going to change. Unbounded, that's where we do the real-time stuff, right? So problems with unbounded data is we very rarely get to see the start, and we've no idea where the end is, because it, there's potentially an infinite amount of data. It potentially goes on forever. That means our query will never end. And that means most queries, when we're processing real-time data, will put some kind of window over the top of that data. In Azure, we have three uh, we have three ways of processing data. We've got Azure Stream Analytics, which is which is my preference. We've got Spark Streaming, which is one of the many talents of this this took this application called Spark. It, it does a whole load of stuff, and it's very very hot at the moment. But Spark Streaming is very good. And then you've got Storm. Storm is massively flexible. It's, um, if you're in Hadoop, it allows you to hook up and process data into Hadoop much more easily. And it is a bigger learning curve, but you do get massive, massive flexibility. You get to understand exactly how each row is processed. We're going to look at Azure Streaming Analytics. OK, so what is it then? It's a processing engine. So you will write a SQL-like query over the top of a stream. There's not the query, SQL Server's query engine underneath. Yeah, it's completely different. It's just, an, it's just a veneer, an abstract over the top. But Microsoft want us to feel warm and cuddly. So like they do in DocumentDB, they give us a SQL-like language, because we all understand that. Right? It integrates nicely with Azure IoT Hub and Event Hubs. If you're coming from AWS, this is Lambda Functions, and it's Kinesis being the queue, Lambda Functions being the, the, the serverless compute that's over the top. 
So here we've got an end-to-end -end architecture. So if you're looking from the left, these are our devices that are pushing data into Azure. We've got our inputs, Event Hub, IoT Hub, Azure Block. Right? The thing about Stream Analytics, which is the transform, although we get temporal joins, we can filter, aggregate, projection, windows, etc. What we can also do is we can we can supplement the data that's coming through in our events with standing data. So you see reference data there. So we can do joins between, uh, essentially it could be a lookup. So maybe we just get IDs of products that come through. But when we actually process it, we want to push in the name of the product. So we can do a join onto that reference data in Stream Analytics. And then we'll push it out to an output. There's a whole load of outputs that we can go to. And we can go to your traditional ones like the Azure Data Warehouse, SQL Azure, Blobs, Event Hubs, ADLS, Power BI, like I mentioned earlier, and Service Bus. And there's, there's more and more being added. So whatever's on this slide is generally out of date whenever I switch over. And then like, once it's in those outputs, we can then consume it through whatever means we want to. What I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to show you exactly what is a streaming analytics query. There's only, there's only three moving parts. There's a source, an input, or inputs, there's a transform, and there's the output. Right? It is that simple. You deploy your query, and it sticks there. We can't change our query. We have to stop it, change the query, restart it. So we can't do it ad hoc like you would normally against the data warehouse. So windowing. So it's where you can define a subset over the data that's coming through to you. And this slide is potentially not as informative as these. OK, so there's three types of window. Tumbling window. So you can have a tumbling window where you have a window of a certain size, and then you have a hop that's exactly the same size. So each window will butt up against the other one. Right? So there's no overlap. And you can perform some kind of aggregate over the top. So you'll see that in this one, uh, which is taken from MSDN, we're doing a count over the entry stream, and we're time stamping it by entry time. That means that the way that you decide what is the window is defined by a field in the data called entry time. Yeah, and you see a group by total ID, and you have this tumbling window of 20 seconds. This is a 20 second window, and it will flop 20 seconds, flop. 20 seconds, flop 20 seconds. So our, our count is a count of total IDs in every 20 second window. Then we've got hopping. Hopping is just a variation of a tumbling. It's where you say, OK, I've got a 20 second window. What I want to do is I want to hop 10 seconds. So you're going to have a 10 second hop, a uh, 10 second overlap every single time. So events will fall into potentially multiple windows. So finally, we've got sliding windows. So sliding windows are where you might want to do things like, what is the average temperature for the last hour? The way that you can do that is you use a sliding window. For this one, it's, it's 20 seconds. So you'll see there again, it's 20 seconds. But one thing to note. Streaming Analytics has no concept of time until an event comes through. So if no events come through, Streaming Analytics has no idea that time has passed. It relies on events to come through to know that time has ticked. Because it could be that even though time has ticked for us, if Streaming Analytics gets an event which is only one second after the last event that it saw, but in actual fact it's 10 hours, as far as Streaming Analytics is concerned, we've moved one second. Simple as that. Yeah, so just be aware that if we don't get events through, time does not tick. There's ways of getting around that. We'd introduce a ticker stream, and we tick time manually just to move things on, move things on, move things on. OK, staging. Data factory. So there's a lot of horror stories going around about data factory. I'm going to try and make them not such horror stories. We'll have a little look at data layer, KSD Insight and Spy. So data factory is kind of like integration services in the cloud. It's not, but it's it, it kind of, it, when people think of it, if they think of it like that, then they're not a million miles away from it. But it's an orchestration engine. 
right? It, it orchestrates the ability for you to pick up data and move it to somewhere else. It's not really integration services in the cloud. But you still have the same same concepts, right? You have data sources, you have linked services, you have processing, you have the ability to process data, do something with it through pipelines, and then you have the ability to send it out somewhere else. This would be your end of day processing. This is what you'd use when you pick up data from blob storage and you'd move it through to, I don't know, the your SQL data warehouse. You'd do that on a schedule, on a schedule, on a schedule, on a schedule. Right. This is a very simple pipeline. Again, this is taken from MSDM, but it's, it's a very easy way of looking at what goes on. Differences in integration services, you'd start with this in Azure Data Factory, you end with this, right? You end with the diagram. There's no drag drop. It is writing JSON or using a tool to write it. In the old days, it used to be that you used to have to write JSON. But now there's extensions to Visual Studio that you can use a wizard that, you, that Microsoft have created in the portal. So you can have that, you know, like when you right click on a, on a database, you can do the import export, kind of similar to that. Then you can schedule that. So this is an example of an Azure Data Factory. This is a screen that you will see. You can see that I've got no data sets defined, no pipelines, no linked service. The three things that I want to call out, copy data. So this is, if you were moving data, a very simple pipeline from blob storage and move it through to Azure SQL DB, you might want to create that in a wizard. So push this button, it'll take you through to another website and you'll create that pipeline. It'll ask you a number of questions. You'll, you get a form that you'll fill in and it will write all the JSON for you. Want to know what's going on? Hit the monitor and manage tab. That will tell you exactly what's happening with your slices, what's processing, what's processed, what's not processed. And it'll also give you a calendar view so you can see what's happened over time as well. Want to go old school? Hit the author and deploy. Author and deploy is where you can get a stub and you will fill out the rest of the JSON yourself. All right, so that's a bit old school or it's, it allows you to look at the JSON that's been deployed for you by the wizard. Yeah, but that's the very core of data factory. Data lake. So two parts to data lake. There's the analytics. So analytics is where we've moved data now and where we've moved it into our store and we want to do big compute over the top of the data. And that would be Azure Data Lake Analytics. And the language that they're currently using is USQL. And it allows you to, it's a mixture of SQL and C sharp. And it allows you to process large amounts of data efficiently and you can scale it out across multiple nodes. HD Insight is Microsoft's implementation of Hadoop and it is very good at batch processing, doing the whole map and reduce where you need to aggregate lots of data and it works on different schemas. What it's not very good for is anything that does joins, I mean, has complex transactional needs. It is very, very definitely not a relational database replacement. Because most people who have relational databases want it to respond in sub-second time. HD Insight is never, ever, ever, ever going to do that for you. So it is definitely not a relational database re replacement. ADL Store, I love this, unlimited scale. There will be a limit, it's just a big limit. Right, so ADL store is WebHDFS. ADL store is meant for, so on a, on a storage account, there's the concept of 20,000 IOPS. So 20,000 input outputs per second. If you're gonna be streaming data in at a vast rate of knots, you might eat those IOPS very quickly. That's where you may want to use as your data lake store because it's got the increased IOPS and it will handle pushing data in at scale and at speed. Okay, serving layer. So this is where now you're going to want to put the data into a store, something that can be consumed by your users. So this is where Power BI might sit over the top. It's where R might sit over the top. It's where your data uh, scientists might come and consume it from. 
2002 DW, relatively new. It's Microsoft Massively Parallel Processing Engine in Azure. It's designed for analytical workloads. It is not designed for transactional workloads. You can store huge amounts of data. You can scale up and scale. One of the beauties of Azure Data Warehouse is the compute and the storage are two completely separate items. And that is, for me, it's a, it's a winner. Very often, we have them tied together. So if you wanted massive amounts of storage, then you generally have to have massive amounts of compute and peer for it. But here, with Azure Data Warehouse, you can have huge amounts of data, very little compute. You can even have no compute. You can essentially turn it off. So here's what happens. Underneath storage, you've got loads of Azure SQL DBs. Right? So you've got 60 of them. Over the top, you've got compute nodes and a control node. So start off with a certain amount of compute. Need more? Turn it on. Need less? Turn them off or resize it. Don't need it at all? Turn them off. Right, so your data will stay exactly where it is. So you don't lose your data. There's nothing happening with that. You're just paying for it, but you are not paying for compute. Then what you can do is you can wake it up and add back the compute. So if you go uh, and search for articles by uh, James Roland Jones, who's on the DW team, he talks a lot about exactly what goes, he's got some really good uh, articles on exactly what goes up to me as your data warehouse. Yeah, so he'll tell you all about concurrency and slots and, and how there's different sizes and how you can group users into different sizes that allows them to use a certain amount of compute but no more. So go and have a look for that. But what happens is a query will come into the control node go to the compute, and the compute will start querying its storage. Storage will return the answer to the compute, which will go to the control node, and then you'll receive a result. That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour. There's, I mean, there's whole days that you could spend on each of those things, but I just wanted to show you a quick demo. So what I've got is a simulated device. It's busy sending pause transactions, so point of sale transactions to IoT Hub. Right. So you can see it's just ticking. It's not ticking madly, but it's ticking. Using this application called uh, Device Explorer, I can connect to the IoT Hub and see what's going on. So if we look at management, I can see that I have one device enabled. So remember, this is the per device authentication. I have one device enabled against IoT Hub. So in the device manager, in the registry of IoT Hub, I have one device. I could have thousands of devices, right? But I've only got the one. And I've got the primary key. I can delete it. I can update it. OK, so let's have a look, see if we can see some data coming through. So enable that, and let's monitor. So you'll see that this is this here is what the IoT Hub is seeing. So you'll see it's ticking through, ticking through, and it's a really good way to understand that IoT Hub is actually seeing something that you're sending. So we know that IoT Hub is seeing data. Now remember what I said to you, it's not all about going one way. We can go the other way. So imagine that I need to talk to the device. All right, so I've got this VS SIM dev, and that's my device, and I need to talk to the device, which is the ticking console window there. What if I sent it a message saying panic? Right. What I would want the device to do is do something, and there you go. So you'll see there. The device has received a message called panic, and all I do when I receive that is I just push it out to the console as um, red. Yeah, but you could do anything there, right? It proves that I've received a message from the hub to say something's going to go wrong. 
And I've also programmed it to, uh, or I've also coded it to uh, receive warning. Yeah. But what you also do is I can send that, and you'll see that there's a little yellow uh, marker there. So yellow, we've received a warning. But you'll also see that my device has sent a message back saying, I got it. And it sends back the correlation ID, right? So you'll see that I sent a message to the device ending in F5A. And the device responded back, said, yep, yeah, I've got it. And your message ID, your correlation ID was F5A. Right? So now the hub can say, OK, I got it. I can remove it from my internal queue. Yeah, and now my other device has responded as well, or my other message has been responded to. So that's me sending messages to the hub and talking back with the hub. But we also need to do something with it. So in Azure, I have artifacts. And here's my hub. Here's my trainer hub. This is what I'm sending data to. And you'll see here that it should, should highlight the fact that I've got one device. It will show me the primary key. And you can also see in here that I'm on an S1 SKU, and I've got one hub unit which means I'm allowed 400,000 messages a day, and I've currently used 6,697. OK, so we, we know we've got those messages going up to IoT Hub. So what we need to do is we need to do something with them. And what I've got is down here is I've got some streaming analytics jobs. These are the things that are going to hook up to the Hub, consume it, do something with it, and deposit the results somewhere. So let's have a look at this one. Three moving parts, you'll see we've got inputs, query, output. This one only has one input, and that's call stream. That is the stream coming from the IoT hub. Remember earlier I said I could have another input there, which is maybe a reference data set that I could join in my query. Here I've got one output, and that's going to blob storage. You can have up to five outputs per job. Personally, I'm not crazy about that because I prefer to have a single query in each job because then if I need to work on it, I can fix my stuff and it doesn't affect you. Because remember what I said? If you, need to, if you need to work on the query, you've got to stop the query so everything stops, which means if I've got five queries in there pushing out to five outputs, that means that when I stop it, I'll stop four others that have got nothing wrong with them. It's just my one part that needs to, needs to change. So you'll see that we've got those there. So this output, we go to blob storage. We can add another output if we wanted. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to go out to blob storage. We're going to go to a container called retail data. Interesting pattern here. So we do, it's going to go to a folder called direct, and I've got date and time. What that means is, based on the date and time of the event, I am going to put it into individual folders. So the folders will be 4 wise MMDD, HH. So we'll be able to walk that through. I'm saying go out as CSV, and it's going to be a comma. Even though CSV means comma separated values, you can actually have tab, you can have pipe, you can, you can have your own delimiter. It asks you what delimiter do you want. Let's have a look at the query. The query is really simple for this one, right? So this is just a straight pass-through query. Looks nice and sequely. So what actually happens? Well, so we're going to go into retail data. Remember, we've got a folder called direct. We've got four Ys, month, month, day, day. Today is the 26th. And here's my hours. So you can see I started this um, a while ago. But you can see I've got 19, 1900 hours because it's on UTC. Let's just have a quick look at what it was. And this is the data that's getting pushed into blob storage. And we'll be able to pull that through Azure Data Factory. And finally, the final thing that I want to show you is just a, an example of an aggregate query. So if we have a look at this. See that again, I've got one input, one output, but my query is very, very different. So for this one, I'm doing a tumbling window of one minute. So remember, tumbling windows are where we butt up, we, 
we tumble for a minute, we jump a minute. We tumble for a minute, we jump a minute. I'm saying give me the shop ID and give me the window open and window closed. Give me the SKU, the sum of the quantity of the amount sold. Push that into the blob sync, which is the destination. And this is from my call stream. And the way that you determine what the time is, is by an attribute of the data, which is receipt date time. Yeah. So I can also call into machine learning functions there if I had. And this is a relatively um, new addition. And I've used this quite successfully. So you could have settings and down here is functions. You could add and there you go. All you do is you give it the URL. So when you create a machine learning function, uh, a machine learning um, endpoint, you get a URL and you get a key. Plug it in, give it an alias, and then you are able to reference that alias inside of your streaming query as, as though you'd written it in TSQL or whatever. Okay, so I know it's been a, a, um, a relatively quick run through, but hopefully now you've had, the, had the, a look and you understand how you can go about building these architectures in Azure. The fast path, the, the hot path, doesn't necessarily need to be rocket science. Microsoft has tried to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to do some really powerful stuff and react to events as they happen and do something about them. So thank you for listening, and um, Mark? Hi, Alan. That was excellent. Thank you very much for that. So we've got a few questions, not many, but um, cool. the, the first one is, I guess, is quite, quite a broad question. So from Joseph, he asks, why do you call it a Lambda architecture? So I'm not sure why. Uh, so it was originally coined by a guy called Nathan Mark, and I think it was in 2003. I'm not too sure why he called it a Lambda architecture to be honest but it's the name that he gave it and I dare say there's, a, there's an interesting question I'm not too sure why he called it lambda architecture or, or any other name. Uh, right yeah. so let's move on to the next question or statement really Ashish, Ashish asked um, he said can we see a working demo of a real-time fraud detection now uh, I, I think that's probably not going to be possible for you to show but uh, would you say that this uh, what you've shown today would be a good solution for fraud detection? Correct. Correct. Definitely. So so the way that you would do that is you would do everything that I've just shown you except what you would do is you would you could well there's a couple of ways that you could do it, right? If you wanted to do it in real time, you'd put a machine learning function into the streaming analytics. If you wanted to do it in slower time, you could use Azure Data Factory when you are picking up that call, the data, and call into machine learning again. So all of this, so there's two ways to do that, and definitely this is a way of doing just that. Okay, great. So the next one, you, you had a couple of examples where you used a 20-second sliding or tumbling window. Yeah. What are some of the considerations that would determine the best window size? Uh, well, it depends on what you're trying to measure. Some people ask, okay, so I could, I could create a window over days and days, could I? And the answer is yes. So what Microsoft do is they don't store every single event. So you're not like butting, butting up, butting, and it's not this big balloon that's growing underneath. Because as it turns out, to store the aggregates, you don't actually need every single single event to be able to store the aggregate. But it really does depend on what your requirements are. So I've got 20 seconds, but it could be a minute, could be an hour, could be whatever. It depends on what you're trying to measure, really. So that would determine data loss as well, wouldn't it, if you have a very big window? Um, so, yeah, the thing is with the window, but you could just replay it, right? So remember from the hub, you can just go back, right? Okay. So you know when I started it up? So if I, if I go back to training and I go to this one, and let's say, let's say I stop it because something's going a bit wonky, then what I can do is I can, I can start it, and it's going to ask me, where do you want to go from? Yes, yeah, so I can start from now, which is everything that appears after this job, when we last stopped, or custom, which is where we can go back. Okay, great. Yeah. So Azure Data Warehouse, is this yeah. really an alternative to Hadoop, and would there ever be a reason to implement both? 
Hadoop is very good at processing unstructured data. If you have data that's of all different shapes, it's a very, very good way of doing that. Things like HBase are, are able to have millions of columns and billions of rows, right? A model that really, really doesn't fit with um, a relational data warehouse. Where Azure Data Warehouse wins is that, like I called out, is A, it's rows and columns. It's got something called Polybase. Polybase is by far the fastest way of loading data into Azure Data Warehouse. But it also has the ability for you to turn off compute, right? So Hadoop, when you spin up a HD Insight cluster, you're spinning it up. And it's, it's live and it keeps running. With Azure Data Factory, one of the interesting things about Azure Data Factory is, if, say if you needed to push data into Hadoop, have it process it, and then come away, what you can do is you can spin up an ad hoc cluster in Azure Data Factory. So what you do is you say, I'd like a, um, a HD Insight cluster. I'm going to give it this workload in Data Factory. And then what I want you to do is I want you to tear it down for me. And Microsoft will do that for you. And there's, there's a special connector in Data Factory that allows you to do that. So you only pay for what you use. And Microsoft build the cluster on their subscription, and then they bill you back. Right? So they don't build it on yours, they just bill you back. Right? So, so there, is, there is definitely a use case for having both, definitely. Excellent. Okay, two very quick final questions then. So the first yep. is your, some of your, your outputs are going to Blob Store. So for these yeah, particular yeah. cases, is geo-replication supported, or should you turn, turn that functionality off? That's a good question. I can't see why it wouldn't be supported. OK. Because I guess the only, the only reason you'd want to turn it off is from a cost perspective, if, of course, it's not supported. OK. And so the, um, the, the next uh, final question is, we see Azure Management Studio, you're using that... Uh, in your demo, is that a free download? Which one? This one? Yeah, that's it. Uh, the Storage Explorer. Uh, there's your, okay, that thing, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's a, a free download. So, but there's others, right? There's other variations on this. And this allows you, what the, the really cool thing is, is you can um, download blobs, you can push up blobs, you can create um, access policies over the blobs, you can create new folders, you can create a new page from file, yes, yeah, so you can go into, if we wanted to do that, we can then go and have a look at the properties and we can view them, and we can see a whole load of stuff, so yeah, there are other other storage explorers that are available, but this one, yeah, this, this one's the one that I'm currently using. Okay, I mean, I'm familiar with the Azure storage explorer, explorer yep. but I've not seen this one before. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So there's another one by there's another one by Cloudberry as well. Right. Cloudberry, okay. I think it's whatever tickles your fancy. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, let's leave it there then. Thank you very much for that, Alan. It was very um, enjoyable. It's, I, you confused me a little bit though, uh, so I may be asking okay. you to come back again sometime. Okay, I'd love to come back.